Greetings, I'm Simone Sanders Townsend, in for Stephanie Rule. Donald Trump's loyal aide, longtime body man, and co-defendant in the classified documents case finally faces his arraignment. Walt Nada appeared in federal court in Miami three weeks after his boss pleaded not guilty to more than three dozen counts in the case. Nada is accused of helping Trump hide top-secret material from authorities after leaving the White House. His hearing had been delayed because of travel issues and because he had been unable to find a local lawyer. But he did find one, and today, in a hearing that lasted just a few minutes, he pleaded not guilty to six counts laid out in last month's indictment. Those charges include conspiracy to obstruct justice, withholding a document or record, and making false statements. Upon leaving the courthouse, Nada made no comments. Mr. Nauta, anything to say? Anything to say about today's appearance, Mr. Nauta? His arraignment comes a day after a federal judge unsealed more of the affidavit the FBI used last summer to get a warrant to search Mar-a-Lago. It describes surveillance footage showing Nada moving dozens of boxes in and out of a storage room days before investigators arrived to collect sensitive records still in Trump's possession. Also tonight, The Washington Post reports the federal prosecutors on this case are now facing increasing threats, including substantial harassment and threats online and elsewhere, according to extremism experts and a government official familiar with the matter. Meanwhile, we're also keeping an eye on the fallout from a judge's ruling barring the White House from contacting social media companies about content on their sites. The Justice Department has already appealed that ruling, and tonight the Biden administration has filed an injunction to keep that ruling from taking effect while their appeal is being heard. Has Twitter finally met its match? It only launched last night, but Meta's new Twitter rival is already exploding in popularity. Threads takes direct aim at Elon Musk's struggling app, with 30 million people signing up in less than 24 hours. The launch is also intensifying an ongoing feud between Musk and Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg. It appeared to reach a boiling point today when, according to Semaphore, Twitter threatened to sue Meta, accusing it of poaching former employees. NBC News senior reporter Ben Collins is here. Ben, my first question is, are we now threading? Is, is that what it is now? I guess that's what it is. I wish okay. it had a cooler name than that, don't you? But I guess I guess they're going with threading for now. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, this okay. is a big deal right now. It's a, uh, you know, 30 million uh, downloads in a day, probably more than that at this point. You know, that's like that's more than New York State. That's more people than there, than are in New York State. That's a big deal. Um, and there's a reason Twitter is freaked out. Um, you can see here uh, people are just going over because they have this idea that it might be better. It's really right now it's not. It's kind of a messy app. It doesn't really work in the way you expect Twitter to. Or okay, wait, it's not it better. Like so tell me, tell me why. Because there are people saying, you know, many people were waiting for a better alternative. I became a threader, I guess, yesterday, but um, it is an app. It's not a website. And I think that is one of the biggest differences between Twitter and this new platform. Yeah, so there are a bunch of differences right now. First of all, like you said, you can't access it on a desktop or a browser or whatever. That's just not available yet. Um, also, it's not chronological yet. So you're going to get stuff from 15 minutes ago or half an hour ago. So it's not really good at things that just happened. If you're trying to figure out if an earthquake just happened or if a terror attack just happened or something, it's not really made for that yet. But what it does have, what's built into this, is the Instagram user base, the Instagram verification user base. And also, it has content moderation. And I know for the last few years, uh, content moderation has become uh, rebranded as censorship. The idea that if you say a bunch of racial slurs, you should be able to uh, say whatever you want on a platform and stay there no matter what. Uh, in uh, Instagram and Facebook never really believed in that. They kept taking people off their platform who harass people on their platforms. So what you have now is a kind of a cleaner space, an, an easier space for a regular person to use on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas Twitter, you just get, frankly, a bunch of Nazis. A, it sounds like a, a friendlier place, frankly. Um, you know, the head of Instagram pointed out yesterday, it's easy to get signups, but it's very hard to build something that makes people, you know, want to stick around. So where did... Twitter go wrong and where 
did Meta get it right? Or frankly, is it too early to say where Meta has gotten it right? Yeah, I want to read you a quote from Elon Musk from uh, November 15th, which is, you know, not that long okay. ago. It's like seven or eight months ago. It says, uh, this is after he fired a bunch of people uh, from the website that were keeping it together. He said, I would like to apologize for firing these geniuses. This is ironic, by the way. Their immense talent will no doubt be of great use elsewhere. Well, guess what? <laughs> uh, he kind of needed those people to run the site. The site was not operable over Fourth of July weekend. Uh, you could not use it. You couldn't open it up. Um, and then once you got back on there, you were just inundated with a bunch of people saying the site was fine and that, you know, Elon is a genius rocket man who's fixing everything for us. And that was just this sort of Kim Jong-un style propaganda that you had to deal with. Um, and then when a different site came along and said, hey, actually, we can give you NBA free agency news. We can give you a highlight from a baseball game. Um, and you won't get yelled at by a bunch of people in a basement. Uh, people really took to that. And I understand why. Again, it has a lot of holes in it. It doesn't work in the way you would want it to work yet. It's meta. They have a lot of money. I'm sure they'll fix it. But and it, looks uh, it cute. works a lot I'm, better. It looks yeah, cute. It looks fine. Looks yeah, cute. It look, it's a little bit better. Let's talk about Zuckerberg and Musk. These two men wield, frankly, enormous power over our media ecosystem. But not even a, a month ago, they were talking about fighting each other in a cage match. I don't think these are the, the words or, frankly, even the actions of, of serious people. What is it about this feud? Are we just all at the mercy of their antics, or is there something else there? Uh, we're all at the mercy of their antics, and there's something else there, right? You know, they are... Uh, two of the richest people in the world. Mark Zuckerberg has a legitimate interest in jujitsu, <laughs> so that's one thing. Uh, Elon Musk has been, uh, you know, in a war of the words with anybody who questions his leadership recently. Um, and he's also on the defensive in general. But, you know, this is, this, these are not really serious guys right now. Um, and they are on their back heels after a bunch of really cataclysmic failures. You know, Mark Zuckerberg poured a bunch of money into this thing called the metaverse, which did not work, frankly. It's not a real thing. Uh, it was this idea that NFTs and all these yeah. ridiculous things that we instantly uh, got, like, ran away from um, would work. That didn't work. This is step two on this. And then, you know, Elon Musk bought Twitter. So uh, <sighs> these are people looking for something else to talk about, and they are definitely going to give it to you. Uh, and yeah. this is their way forward. This is a big PR push by both of them. All right. Well, we will be watching. I'll be threading and tweeting and all the things. Ben Collins, thank you very, very much. NBC News has exclusive new reporting that former American officials have held secret talks with Russian officials about the war in Ukraine. The goal? Laying a foundation for potential negotiations to eventually bring the war to an end. Sources say Russia's top diplomat, Sergei Lavrov, met with some of those former U.S. officials for hours in April in New York City. And new fallout from the failed mutiny in Russia led by the Wagner Group. You may remember it ended in an apparent deal that would allow leader Yevgeny Prigozhin and his soldiers to settle in Belarus in exile. But this morning, Belarus's president said Prigozhin is in Russia, despite being essentially banned from the country by the Kremlin. Joining me now to discuss it all is William Taylor, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. He's also the United States Institute of Peace vice president for Russia and Europe. <clears throat> Pardon me, Mr. Ambassador, my allergies. I, I want to start with these secret talks. How exactly are these talks happening without Ukraine? They should not be, Simone. The basic rule on any negotiation, whether it's government to government or non-government to non-government, or in this case, non-government government to government, that is Sergei Lavrov, um, the basic rule on any of those is you don't talk about a nation who's not there. In this case, you don't talk about Ukraine between Americans and Russians. Uh, if you want to talk about, about Ukraine, you want to talk about the war, then you have Ukrainians at the table. This is the basic rule that apparently was violated. You know, uh, and I encourage people, Mr. Ambassador, to read the NBC News reporting because the, the story I do think is very illuminating. I have spoken with a member of the Ukrainian parliament about two weeks ago, and I asked that particular member of parliament, said, okay, 
wars are ended at negotiating tables, eventually you all will have to negotiate. And what 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 will it take? And the member of parliament said something that I continue to hear from Ukrainians that they will take nothing less than Ukrainians full Ukraine's full sovereignty being adhered to. They want all of the Ukraine Ukraine's land back. Um, and. I guess I just I don't understand how a back channel like this uh, is the right strategy or, or or could it be? And just if Ukrainians were at the table, this could be a little different. You're right. Uh, the, the grounds, the basis for negotiation between the Russians and Ukrainians at this point are just not there. The Ukrainians position is exactly what you said, Simone. They want the Russians out of their country. They want the Russians out of all of their country. The Russians, on the other hand, they said they've annexed part of uh, Ukraine and they're not going to give that up. Now, that suggests that there's no overlap. There's no grounds for negotiations. So to have Americans talking to Russians without the Ukrainians at the table, um, again, uh, violates the rule and, and is not productive. But, but what does it say then about Russia's stance that their officials are even at these meetings? I mean, Sergei Lavrov is no, you know, small fish. He is no small fish. Um, on the other hand, one can't really believe him. That, that's a problem for the lead diplomat. This is the man, Simone. We remember, you reported um, that before the invasion, Sergei Lavrov told the world, and indeed told the United States, told the Europeans that they were not going to invade Ukraine. We, we remember, he said, he said that, oh, the Americans are hysterical. They're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to panic people. And, and sure enough, a week later, the Russians invaded Ukraine. So, you, so talking to this man, um, certainly without the Ukrainians, maybe not at all, um, is, not, is not a productive exercise. Mm. Well, uh, let me get your reaction to Lukashenko's announcement that uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin is actually in Russia. What could be going on here? What's going on here is the is the result of a, of a very unclear negotiation, a very unclear deal. I mean, again, you've reported on how the deal was struck, Simone. Um, it was through a third party, through uh, President Lukashenko from uh, from uh, from Belarus. Um, and they weren't directly negotiating with each other. That is, Putin and Prigozhin were not talking to each other directly. Um, and there's probably nothing written down. Uh, so no one really knows what the agreement is. And neither side can be trusted, counted on, to abide by whatever they think the deal was. So uh, Prigozhin is apparently wandering around somewhere in Russia, maybe with 25,000 of his soldiers still with him, which can't make Putin happy. It can't make Putin pleased that here's this mutineer, this man who has generated a res uh, an insurrection uh, against his government, Putin's government, and he is somewhere in Russia, apparently still with his soldiers. So there, it's not clear that there was any real deal there in the first place. Mm, the story develops. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, there is a key NATO summit on Tuesday. This week, you were one of dozens of foreign policy experts who signed a letter arguing that Ukraine should be presented with a roadmap to join NATO as soon as possible. Now, President Biden has said he believes Ukraine should go through the same process as everyone else. Why is fast-tracking Ukraine's membership so important? So actually, I think President Biden has gone a little bit farther than that. He has, he has agreed that they don't have to, the Ukrainians don't have to go through what other nations, uh, not all other nations, uh, but some nations had to go through what's called a membership action plan. President Biden, I think, has agreed that, they, that the Ukrainians don't have to do that. The, the uh, Finns uh, didn't have to do that. They're in. The Swedes are almost in. They didn't have to go through that. So President Biden has agreed that, that the Ukrainians can go faster than some of the earlier versions of this. But President Biden hasn't yet agreed that the Ukrainians should get an invitation from the Vilnius summit to, to sometime become a member. Everybody understands that the Ukrainians are not going to join while there's active fighting. Everybody understands that. President Zelensky has said that. However, what is really important uh, is that Ukraine have a signal, have an invitation have a reason to believe that they will join, to 
concrete reason to believe that they will join NATO in order to secure their own self, their own land. Um, and that will make us better off, Simone. That'll make the United States better off. That'll make Europe better off. Um, and that will mean that the world is a more secure place. Mm. Ambassador William Taylor, thank you.